Welcome to another IB Environmental Systems and Societies video. Today's topic is 4.1 Water Systems. In this video, we're going to examine how water moves around our planet and within ecosystems. We're also going to discuss how human activities affect the flows and storages of water within the hydrological cycle. Because water is fundamental to all life on Earth, understanding our systems is essential for addressing environmental challenges like water scarcity, pollution, and climate change impacts. Let's get into it. The movements of water in the hydrosphere are driven by two main forces, solar radiation and gravity. Solar radiation provides the energy that powers evaporation and transpiration. When the sun heats water in oceans, lakes, rivers, and soil, it transforms liquid water into water vapor. This process requires energy, and that energy comes directly from the sun. Gravity, on the other hand, pulls water downwards. It causes precipitation to fall from clouds to the Earth's surface. It drives water downhill in rivers and streams, and it pulls water through soil in the processes of infiltration and percolation. Without gravity, the water cycle would stop as water wouldn't flow downhill or move through underground aquifers. When you look at this diagram of the hydrological cycle, you can identify the main processes and components. Notice how solar radiation drives evaporation from the oceans, while gravity pulls precipitation down and drives river flow back towards the oceans. This continuous movement of water between the atmosphere, land, and oceans represents one of Earth's most important systems. In the hydrological cycle, we need to identify which parts of the cycle are driven by heat and which are driven by gravity. Heat-driven processes include evaporation, transpiration, and the formation of clouds through condensation. Gravity-driven processes include precipitation, surface runoff, infiltration, percolation, and groundwater flow. The global hydrological cycle operates as a system with stores and flows. In water cycle diagrams, stores are shown as boxes and flows are shown as arrows. The size of boxes and arrows should represent the relative magnitude or size of each store or flow. A system includes storages, which is places where water is held, and it also includes flows, which are movements of water between storages. In the water cycle, major stores include oceans, ice caps, groundwater, lakes, rivers, the atmosphere, and living organisms. Flows include processes like evaporation, precipitation, and runoff that move water between those different stores. When you create a systems diagram for the water cycle, you have to remember to represent stores as boxes and flows as arrows. Again, the size of each part should reflect its relative importance in the system. For example, the ocean storage would be represented by a much bigger box than the atmospheric storage because the oceans contain vastly more water than the atmosphere does. This systems approach helps visualize and understand the connections between different parts of the water cycle and how changes in one part of it can affect the entire system. The main water stores in the hydrological cycle include the oceans at 96.5%, glaciers and ice caps at 1.7%, groundwater at another 1.7 percent, then surface freshwater, atmosphere, and organisms, all at fractions of a percent. You don't need to memorize these numbers exactly, but you should know how big each part is compared to the others. Looking at this diagram, you can better understand the relative proportions of water on Earth. The first pie chart shows that 97 percent of Earth's water is in seas and oceans, and only 2.8 percent being freshwater. The second pie chart shows that 68.7% of Earth's freshwater is in ice and 30% is in groundwater and only three-tenths of a percent is surface water. Then that third pie chart shows that of that 0.3% of freshwater that's on the surface, most of it, about 87%, is in lakes. 11% is in wetlands and only 2% is in rivers. This visual representation should help you grasp just how limited accessible freshwater is on our planet, and that highlights why water conservation and management are so important. I like this diagram because it's a different way of looking at the same information as the pie charts in the previous slide. It kind of looks like water is flowing from one part of the system to another, which it is. This diagram can help answer questions about water storage and usage. Humans use only about 0.03% of all the globe's freshwater, and that's mainly from groundwater, lakes, and rivers. Most of the freshwater that people use is for agriculture, and that accounts for 73% of all human water use. We use about 11% of our freshwater to treat pollution, 
which is almost exactly the same as the amount of fresh water that people return to the atmosphere through evaporation from reservoirs, man-made lakes, and other infrastructure like irrigation channels. Flows in the hydrological cycle include transpiration, sublimation, evaporation, condensation, advection, precipitation, melting, freezing, surface runoff, infiltration, percolation, stream flow, and groundwater flow. Each of these processes represents a different way that water moves between stores. For example, transpiration is the release of water vapor from plants, and that moves water from organisms back to the atmosphere. Sublimation is the direct conversion of ice to water vapor, and that moves water from ice caps and glaciers back to the atmosphere. Advection is the horizontal movement of water vapor by wind. You can think of that as clouds moving across the landscape as they drift by on the wind. This diagram illustrates the various flows in the hydrological cycle. Remember that flows are the movement of water through the cycle. Evaporation occurs when heat from the sun causes water to change from liquid to vapor. Condensation happens when water vapor cools off and forms clouds. Precipitation includes rain, snow, sleet, and hail falling from clouds to the surface of the earth. Surface runoff is water flowing over land towards bodies of water, where infiltration and percolation involve water moving into and through soils. These processes connect the different water stores and they maintain the continuous cycling of water throughout Earth's system. Human activities can significantly alter the flows and stores in the hydrological cycle. We're going to examine three key activities, agriculture, deforestation, and urbanization. Slide 12, agriculture impacts. Agriculture alters hydrological flows in many different ways. Irrigation withdraws water from rivers and aquifers, and that often reduces natural stream flow. Much of this water is lost to evaporation, especially in open irrigation canals and with inefficient irrigation methods. These withdrawals can significantly change local and regional water availability. When water withdrawals for agriculture exceed natural inputs, the water table drops. This is happening in many regions worldwide where groundwater is being pumped faster than it can be naturally replenished. The Ogallala Aquifer in the central United States, for example, is being depleted at an alarming rate due to intensive irrigation for crop production. Agricultural practices also impact infiltration and runoff rates. Crop cultivation, especially monocultures, reduces plant diversity and it can decrease the interception of rainfall compared to diverse forests. This often leads to increased surface runoff and soil erosion, particularly in areas where natural vegetation has been cleared for farming. Livestock farming can compact soil, reducing its ability to absorb water through infiltration. When animals repeatedly walk over the same areas, they compress the soil, and that squeezes the particles closer together and limits the pore space or the gaps between those particles. This makes it harder for water to penetrate into the soil, so more of it runs off horizontally across the surface. That horizontal runoff can lead to erosion and the loss of the most nutrient-rich layers of topsoil, which of course is the soil that farmers need most to grow their crops. Additionally, at large scales, animal waste can infiltrate groundwater or surface water sources, potentially causing massive pollution problems. Deforestation significantly alters hydrological flows by reducing transpiration from plants, which decreases atmospheric moisture. Removing forests also decreases the interception of precipitation by vegetation. Interception is when raindrops hit tree leaves and break into smaller droplets, and that reduces the force they exert on soils, and this prevents erosion. The less interception there is, the more surface runoff and soil erosion there is. Deforestation also reduces infiltration and groundwater recharge because the water can move off-site more quickly. Remember the Amazon forest tipping point we studied earlier in the syllabus? Removing forests can also alter local climate and precipitation patterns because there's less water returned to the atmosphere by transpiration. Urbanization alters hydrological flows in several key ways. Impermeable surfaces like concrete and asphalt increase surface runoff and flood risk by preventing water from infiltrating into the soil. This reduced infiltration also decreases groundwater recharge. Storm drains and channelized streams accelerate water transfer or movement to rivers, and that often leads to more severe flooding downstream. Urbanization creates heat islands that affect local evaporation rates. 
The urban heat island effect occurs because buildings, roads, and other urban infrastructure absorb and retain heat more effectively than natural landscapes. This can increase local temperatures by 3 to 10 degrees Celsius compared to surrounding rural areas. This diagram illustrates how urban heat islands impact the water cycle. Urban areas have less plant transpiration and water evaporation from soil compared to rural areas. Dark roads, parking lots, and rooftops retain heat, while the lack of trees reduces shade and evapotranspiration that would otherwise help cool the air. Heat that's trapped by buildings keeps urban cores warmer at night, and waste heat from factories, buildings, and vehicles also adds to the heat island effect. These higher temperatures affect evaporation rates, and they can alter local precipitation patterns as well. The steady state of any water body can be demonstrated through flow diagrams of inputs and outputs. Remember, a steady state exists when inputs balance outputs, resulting in no net change in the amount of water stored. For example, a lake is in steady state when water entering through rainfall, streams, and groundwater equals water leaving through evaporation, outflow, and groundwater seepage. We can use the concept of inputs and outputs to calculate sustainable rates of water harvesting from aquifers and surface water sources. Sustainable water use means withdrawing water at a rate that doesn't exceed its natural replenishment. For example, if an aquifer receives 100 million cubic meters of recharge annually, withdrawals can't exceed this amount if we want to maintain a steady state. Using this diagram, we can identify and calculate the net inputs and outputs for different storages in the hydrological cycle. For the atmosphere, inputs include evaporation from oceans, evaporation from lakes, and evapotranspiration from plants. This totals about 577,000 kilometers. Outputs include precipitation to oceans and precipitation to lakes, and those also total about the same as all of the inputs. These balanced inputs and outputs demonstrate the steady state equilibrium of the global water cycle. That's it for topic 4.1 water systems. By examining how water moves through the hydrosphere and how human activities affect those movements, you can develop more sustainable approaches to water management. Until next time, happy learning.